Okay, when I was a kid, um, people would talk to me, and adults would talk to me, and they would tell me things that they expected me to hear and remember. And I wouldn't. And I would say things like, I didn't hear you. Have your kids ever said that to you? The room isn't clean. I didn't hear you, right? The homework isn't done. I didn't hear you. You didn't make... It goes on and on. I used to say, I, don't, I didn't hear you. And people used to think in my family that I literally had a physical hearing problem. I did not. Amen. Some of you are way too smart for that. I didn't, I didn't have a hearing problem. I had a focus problem. And I think, I, honestly, I would think I was a little bit undiagnosed ADD. And, and, and gosh, I mean, if you had a TV on in the room while you were talking to me, forget it. Like, I wasn't getting anything. If there were any other distractions, it's, I mean, I can't even imagine if I would have grown up with smartphones around, oh my goodness, I wouldn't have heard anything anybody said ever. ADD. Again, never diagnosed. I'm pretty sure some of you guys know me pretty well. You would say, yes, for sure, I'm ADD. Um, I, Linda does this thing with me sometimes um, where she'll call because she knows this about me and she knows that I can't change who I am physically, but what I can do is bring disciplines into my life that make it a little bit more manageable. And so when she calls me, especially if she's talking to me about something that's really important, one of the little things that Linda will say on the phone is she will say, Josh, what are you doing right now? And that's code for, I hope you're paying attention to me. That's code for, I hope you're not typing on your keyboard or messing with your phone or anything else. I hope that you're focused because she's about to tell me something really, really important. Of course, the point I'm trying to get to is that I think in our culture, we're all a bit ADD. And I think we have a focus problem. And what's going to be surprising in the text today, once we get into it, is you're going to find that Jesus is specifically speaking to this area of focus and listening, and he's going to tell people 2,000 years ago, they had a listening problem and a focus problem as well. So maybe ADD's been around for a long time. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1 is where we're going. So this is parable number one in this parable series. We're probably going to do six of these or so. And this one is very important today that we're going to read because this one is where Jesus not only gives us a parable, but he is going to describe why he taught in parables, why it was his strategy at all. He's going to describe to us parables. So here's kind of the structure of Matthew chapter 13, at least the part that we're going to read today. It's going to be in three big pieces Uh, just so that you can kind of track where we're at. It's going to begin with Jesus is going to give the parable, which is going to be like this earthly story illustration thing. And then the disciples are going to ask him why he does parables in the first place, and he's going to describe that. That's going to be point two. And then point three is he's going to swing back around, and he's going to interpret for them what the parable meant. Three parts. Are you with me? Okay, so verse 1, later that same day, Jesus left the house and he sat beside the lake. So he's on a seashore, a lake shore there. A large crowd soon gathered around him. And so he got into, Jesus got into a boat and then he sat there and he taught as the people stood on the shore. I like that he was sitting and they all had to stand as opposed to me standing the whole time and you all sitting. I think I'd like to reinstitute a more biblical way of church. <laughs> just, just joking. Anyway, um, so this is what Jesus does. He sits down in a boat. Now, why would he do that? So you got to imagine him on the shore, and all these people are kind of crowding around. They all can't see him necessarily, and they all can't hear him because there's too many people. So he has this brilliant idea. He hops into a boat, goes out, for, uh, out into the water just a little bit. They must have set down anchor, and then Jesus is able to see everybody that's lined up on the shore. And the uh, scholars say the acoustics of the water behind him would have helped them all to hear him better as well. So Jesus knows what he's doing. Amen? Amen. No sound system. He knows what he's doing. And he's about to give them farming advice. Verse 3, he told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to, the plant, to plant some seeds. And as he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on the footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock, 
and the seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Now, Jesus has given us two kinds of seeds right there, and I'll just say this quickly. He's giving us, um, again, a farming parable, a farming bit of advice. He's talking about somebody scattering seed, and the farmer is not doing a good job so far. Can we agree to that? You're going to get four different kinds of soil that he's going to scatter seed onto, and the first two are definitely not successful. You need to aim better man. Okay, verse 6. Other seeds fell among the thorns that, that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. Verse 9. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. First, he began the parable, if you paid attention really, really closely, he said the word listen. The Greek there is a command. Listen to me, he says. Then he gives them the farming illustration, and he gets to the end of it and says, if you've got ears, who's got ears? We should have 100% ears in this room, yes? If you've got ears, you need to hear, you need to listen, and you need to understand. You see the progression that he gives there. It's not just about letting the sound waves hit your physical ears. It's about listening and focusing and understanding. And then we're going to get to and complying and living and loving as well. Because that's where Jesus eventually wants us to go. But why is he giving us a farming illustration? There's four different kinds of dirt. And then he says, it's about you listening. Now, If they just heard that, his little farming illustration, and then he just said, now let's close in prayer. Can you imagine that for a second? Now, that would rattle you a little bit because many of you have gone to Sunday school or you've heard this sermon on this passage given multiple times. So you know that we're going to preach on these different seeds and on these different soils for a lot of this message. But they didn't know that at the time. All they heard was this farming illustration, and then Jesus was done, and he moved on. And you've got to get your imagination into that space of like being a person sitting there and saying, I've come to hear Jesus Christ who does miracles and he's so popular. I want to hear what he has to say. And all he tells you is about casting seed. And you're like, what in the world is going on here? Right? Like, and, and then he, he closes it with saying, now if you've got ears to hear, you should hear, and what he's indicating to you is that all this whole, this whole illustration about farmer and his seeds, it's about hearing better. And so then you start to realize, okay, my first clue is, is I'm supposed to hear better, and I can see it in the seeds, yes? I can see it in the seeds, which means I'm not the farmer. I'm the dirt. So can we have the dirts up there? You're either no dirt, shallow dirt, divided dirt, or good dirt. That's what Jesus just shared. Jesus just called you dirt, amen? He just called us dirt. But it's it's what kind of dirt am I? And and, and it's about listening, and and depending on what kind of listener I am, I'll have different results according to Jesus. So what kind of listening are we talking about here? Like, take the next step in your imagination, right? You're starting to listen. You're trying to listen. You're trying to understand. Is this about uh, marriage listening? Maybe this is a marriage seminar. Is this about listening to my kids? Maybe it's about listening in class, right? Because, like, I can definitely relate. Like, there's some times that I've been a no-dirt student in somebody's class, right? The teacher's talking, and you're just not, you're, you're not registering anything. Or sometimes I'm really shallow about, like, I'm listening a little bit, I'm smiling along, but I'm not really understanding, not really engaging, not really asking questions. Sometimes I might even take notes, but I don't come back to the notes because I'm divided dirt, Well, what does that mean? It means, well, the seed got planted in my mind, but there are other things that are also happening, right? Like like the weeds and and, and the thorns are also kind of growing up around it. It's going to limit the potential. So the night before the test, I decided to go hang out with some friends instead of studying. Do you see how other priorities came in? And I'm not going to get the A on the test. I'm going to get the B on the test. Maybe that's what Jesus has given us, is study strategies. Is that it? Of course it's not it. There's more to it than that. But they don't know. That's the part where you've got to really stop in your imagination for a second and realize in the first century, they didn't know. 
he spoke to them in parables. And he has lots of parables. And he's going to explain to us what this parable means. But most of the parables that are written in the Gospels have no explanation afterward. And you're like, well, pastors explain it to me. I understand. And they're doing their best. But Jesus didn't give explanations to every single one of them. Why? Because every parable is an invitation to listen. Amen. Every parable is an invitation to stop and think for a minute. And sometimes we've, we lose that art form, don't we, in the church? I just want somebody to just explain it to me, Pastor. Just explain it to me. Actually, maybe you need to stop, and maybe you need to ponder and meditate on it. Okay, next, verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 10. His disciples came and asked him, and now this is a brilliant transition in the text. Why do you use parables, Jesus, when you talk to people? So pause right there really quick. So the disciples are coming in there saying, why, Jesus, why teach this way? Now, here in them, like maybe they would like to advise Jesus on a better way for him to teach. You should be laughing right? Greatest teacher who ever lived. Why why are you using parables, Jesus? Like, why are you making this mysterious? Why just give people this farming illustration? Why not tell them straight? Because Jesus, if we're really going to have a big spiritual movement here, and if you're going to be a really popular teacher, maybe you should just do some two and a half minute YouTube videos that are nice and clear and have color illustrations and get the point across. Isn't that a better way, Jesus? You hear what they're asking? Jesus, we want followers. Jesus, you're sending people away who don't know what you meant. And they didn't sign the nice card, Jesus. Come on. Work with us here. So I get it. But Jesus is going to respond to them in kindness. He replied, you're permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding that they have will be taken away from them. Jesus says the parable is not a preaching illustration. Now, when I was a kid growing up in the church, I thought that's what parables were. They used to tell me this is a, this is a, a, a spiritual point and it's being made with an earthly story. So there's something really complex and it's hard to understand. So Jesus comes to make an illustration for you in in order for you to understand it. Uh, Sometimes in the preaching world, the teaching world, we'll talk about pull things off the top shelf where, where things are hard for people to reach and bring them down to the bottom shelf with your teaching so everybody can access that stuff. Like that's what a good illustration is, right? Jesus is saying, what I'm teaching, that's not the point, I'm actually trying to hide truth. That's what he just said. He said, I'm trying to take a kingdom treasure that'll change people's lives, and I'm actually wrapping it in a mystery and a riddle intentionally. So for those people who come to it with the right kind of a heart, they will be able to unwrap the treasure and get to that kingdom truth that will change their life. But for those people who don't actually have the right kind of heart, it'll actually be closed off to them and they're going to walk away from the seashore and not understand any of this. Because the whole rest of this that we're going to read today that's going to bless us, you've got to realize the rest of the crowd didn't hear this. Only the disciples did. And what's up with the disciples? The disciples are different because they're following Jesus and they're coming and asking questions of Jesus with their ears open and ready to listen. And because they're coming with those heart qualities about them, Jesus is speaking to them. So, Jesus' parables, not only is there a treasure there, but the parable is a test of your heart. And it's not testing your morality It's not testing your religiosity. It's testing your listening ability. William Barclay says it like this. He says, The parable conceals truth from those who are either too lazy to think or too blinded by their prejudice or their own agendas to see 
It puts the responsibility fairly and squarely on the individual. It reveals truth to him who desires the truth, and it conceals truth from him who does not wish to see the truth. Think about all the different people listening on the shore to Jesus. There's religious people and non-religious people. There's Jewish people. There's Roman people. There's men and women. There's slaves and free. There's young and old. There's all these different kinds of people, and they're all listening And Jesus says, the two categories I see are people who are listening and people who are not. You're like, well, why wouldn't you listen to Jesus? Because maybe you showed up that day saying, Jesus, you've got to prove to me what you're saying is true. Jesus, I want to debate you. Jesus, you can come and talk to me as long as everything you say agrees with the tribe I'm already a part of. Jesus, you can come and you can talk to me as long as you don't actually require me to change the things that are most important in my life. Jesus, you can come and you can add add some nice, soft, bumper sticker theology into my life. But don't you dare turn my world upside down. Jesus says his parables are a listening test. It's about how you come. It's like, well, that's that's not what we want. Is it? Like, we don't want the parable to be about how the soils receive the seed. We want it to be about how the farmer should, should aim better yes. and should do better. Yes. But that's not what he gives. Because if we're the soils, guys, then the farmer's God. The farmer's Jesus. And he casts seed everywhere. Whew. Next. Verse 19, Jesus starts to describe. So this is the third part. This is where Jesus describes what the parable means. So you're going to see these four seeds again, okay? Four seeds. Verse 19, the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and they don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their heart. So that first one doesn't doesn't even get into the soil, right? It just sits on top of the soil and it's going to get stolen away. The next seed on the rocky soil, soil represents those who hear the message and they immediately receive it with joy. So they're glad about God's word right? They're they're receiving it with joy. It's very emotional. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last very long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. So the disciples are listening to everything that Jesus is saying. He's giving them the explanation. And again, remind yourself that the crowds didn't get this explanation. And on most of the parables for the rest of the series, you're not going to get the explanation either. Jesus is showing how God is kind to the disciples because they ask and because they listen. And Jesus gives them more depth. Also, Jesus clarifies the seed there before we move on to the next part. He says, it's the message of the kingdom. The seed is the message of the kingdom. So we just want to address something super fast. The message of the kingdom is the seed. Some of us have been taught this parable as the message of the kingdom must mean an altar call gospel presentation. And so what this entire parable is trying to describe to us is like a Billy Graham crusade where everybody's given the gospel preached and they all respond in their different ways. And the four different kinds of responses are the four different kinds of seed. And while that's, especially to you Christians, while that's partly true, it's way too limited of an understanding of this parable. Because the message of this kingdom goes way, way beyond those initial truths that you receive when you first reach out to Jesus. When Jesus said the message of the kingdom, what he meant was everything he was teaching them. He meant everything that's in God's word. And he meant everything that was himself. Because when God spoke, he spoke, he spoke through his son, he spoke through his son, but Jesus himself was the word of God. So in a sense, the cross itself and the resurrection, the kindness of Jesus and all of his miracles, that is all who God is and what he wants us to accept. So some of you guys are like, hey, I had that time when I was six years old and I accepted the gospel and I'm good, but all this other stuff in the scripture, I'm not really ready to take that stuff yet. See, this parable doesn't, it doesn't let you wiggle out like that. The message of the kingdom is so much more. 
This also is where it grabs the rest of you. If you're not a Christian, you've been following God for a long time, I could still say to you, how's your listening doing? Like, you used to listen. You used to be excited. You used to want God to turn your life upside down. Do you still? Because he still wants to. And that farmer is him. He clarifies that. Um, Why is God so inefficient as a seed sower? Why is he scattering so much seed everywhere? Here's the answer. God is not sowing his seed for worldly success. God is trying to get the gospel to every single pair of ears in existence. That's what he's trying to say. When you're somebody who's speaking the gospel, you speak it to everyone, and you don't shut anybody out, and God doesn't shut anybody out. Everybody gets their chance to hear, and that's why in the, in the parable, the farmer casts it everywhere. There's a day that will come where we'll all stand before God, and he will ask us what we did with his son. He will ask us what we did with the gospel. He will ask us what we did with our life. And there are scriptures that say, and they will be without excuse. Do you know why we'll be without excuse? Because God gave us every chance to know him. And that's what this parable is trying to show us. Now we'll keep reading verse 23. We got two more seeds we didn't read. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. And then verse 23, the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and they understand God's word and they produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as what was planted. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So here's the four seeds, and I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on these four seeds um, because there's some more stuff that I want to say to you. But just briefly, no listen at all. Some of us got drugged to church today, and we're just getting through it. God bless you. I love you. Praying for you. But you just need to know that just being in the room and just letting stuff hit your ears is not enough. Because you're the one who stands guard over your own soul. And that's what that first, seed, that first soil, I should say, is trying to say. Is you decide what gets into you, truly. Amen. Next, the shallow listen. They barely got into the dirt. They spring up fast, no depth, super joyful, super emotional. And they fall away from the faith by the time they hit the parking lot. We've been here. Even all of these different dirts, by the way, all these different kinds of listening, I could ask you, which dirt are you? And really, the answer that you need to give me is it depends on the date. Because I've spent time in every single one of these. And some of these categories, I've been there a really long time, longer than I should have been there. And sometimes it depends on the truth of God that we're talking about because there are some truths in the scripture about Jesus that I've been really stubborn about across my whole life. Where are you at? Uh, There's a ministry called Young Life. Anybody ever hear of Young Life? Young Life is a very important ministry. Uh, Linda and I have got a friend, Matt and Sarah Galatz, uh, back in Illinois, and they're massively into Young Life. And uh, Young Life, kind of the idea here is that um, there are a lot of cities that don't have healthy youth groups for their students. And so Young Life will go in, and they will have a community-based youth group. So all the kids that are not in a church where they can do that youth group there, they can go to Young Life's youth group, and they have a weekly meeting. And it's, and it's massive, and it's this big deal, and they're, the, all throughout the year, they're trying to get these students into their youth camp um, during the summer, and they've got these beautiful, wonderful youth camps that they will send students to, and while they're there at this, this camp experience, and some have never been to camp, by the way, but at their, while they're there at this camp experience, they're going down like tube slides, and they're sitting at a campfire, and they're singing Kumbaya, you know? And they're hearing good Bible teaching and good gospel teaching. And a lot of them are accepting the gospel and they're reaching out to Jesus for the very first time. It's a massive, massive thing. But I was reading this week, there's, a, there's this idea that young life staff have. 
and they call it tubing it, tubing it, where some of the students will come to camp and they'll do the whole experience and they'll accept Jesus in a big moment. But weeks after camp, they'll renounce their faith. And it's like their faith went right down the tubes. Like they came for the tubes and then it went down the tubes. You know what I'm saying? So they're just tubing it. And they're just talking about the reality. And I think many of us, especially if you grew up in the church, you've had this experience where you've seen people who really looked like they were massively into Jesus Christ and then a year later they were gone. See, this is not a new experience. Jesus is talking about that right here. The next seed is that divided listen. So in the first one, if it's, a, if it's a really fast growth and then it's a really fast crash, the third one, this divided listen, it's this idea of a slow choke. And so some of you guys came to faith and there were other things in your life that took the resources away from your faith. So if you've planted anything before, you know that weeds don't poison the good plants, do they? They don't poison the good plants. What a weed does is the weed steals all the sunshine, it steals all the water, and it steals all the room, and that's what chokes out the plant. And it doesn't happen overnight, it happens slow. So Jesus is saying, like, some of you got it fast, but some of you guys, your faith is going to die slow. Woo! We don't like hearing that, do we? Because other things come in. And again, we've seen this before. The worries of this life, other life priorities. I don't have time. I don't want Jesus to come in and to speak to that thing that is so important to me. And the fourth kind of seed is he calls it a good listen. Luke 8, 15, which is another gospel passage where it says this same uh, parable. Jesus says, they hear it and they cling to it and they bear fruit. So you take his word and you say, God, I don't just want it to hit my ears. I want to I meditate on it and I want to cling to it and I want to chew it and I want to take as long as it's going to take for me to get this thing into my life. Years ago, um, the church I was at in Illinois, there was a season where I was asked to be the kids pastor, which is a bad idea, by the way. <laughs> I was asked to be a kid's pastor, and, and, and um, we had lost our kid's pastor, and it was like a nine-month search for the next kid's pastor, and, and uh, that's, that's not an easy deal. And so I, I, I jumped in, and I'm trying to run the kid's ministry, and um, God had this for me. He had so much for me because there was stuff I didn't understand about kid's ministry, and here's the number one thing I didn't understand. I didn't understand that we've got teachers back there who are powerfully gifted in the Holy Spirit. And they are back there teaching our kids with amazing skill and heart. And I'm so thankful for them, but I had to see it for myself week in and week out. So one of those teachers at the time was Debbie Austin, and, and we had our elementary room, and there were maybe 40 or 50 kids in this elementary room, and she was sitting there, and, you know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to run the program, but she's the expert, you know, and I walk in, and I'm in the back. I think I was messing around with, like, the, the sound system or something like that, trying to get it to work, and it was just chaos in there, and everybody's yelling and running around, and you're kind of wondering, it's like, how in the world is she going to get control? And the way that she's probably going to get control is she's going to start yelling louder than the kids and making them submit. Yes? It's not what she did. So she got up to the edge of the stage and she sat down and she just started talking normal voice. It was crazy. And she just started talking. And all of a sudden, one kid could tell that she was talking. They couldn't hear. So what they had to do is they had to stop yelling so that they could hear what she said. And, and they were still struggling to hear, so they had to walk actually closer to her and quiet down in order to hear what she would say because it was the only way if you wanted to know what Miss Debbie was saying because already for weeks even before that, she had earned their respect. Already she had earned their ears already. So when she sat down and she just started speaking normal volume, you sat there for like a minute or two and it was like magic. Everybody just started to very slowly quiet down, walk toward her, and after a few minutes, everybody's just sat in front of her listening to every word that she's saying. Wow. That's Jedi stuff right there, yeah. right? That's amazing. <laughs> so if you're like, I'm going to go right home and try that with my kids. 
Again, it's a process. I'm sure she built that over time. So here's the point. Debbie Austin did not compete. This world is loud. And God does not compete. He will not shout at you in order to get louder than an already loud world. He will come and speak quietly. And it's up to you to listen. Amen. And it's up to you to seek. And it's up to you to come toward him. I mean, isn't that the way that this works? And it's the way that we wish it would work. I mean, our speakers, whoever's speaking to us, whoever, who's, who's ever telling us anything, we want them to be loud. We want them to hook us. We want them to win our attention. We want them to speak with color and volume and savvy and better marketing if you want my attention. We want them to come with a two and a half minute YouTube clip that is shorter, edgier, and more punchier than the next guy. And if you give me that, then maybe I will give you two and a half minutes of my attention sitting down right here. You can have a tiny bit of influence on me. And maybe I'll listen. And after I listen, I'm done. It's a quick hit and I move on. Why? Because it might grab me for a moment, but it's disposable. That kind of messaging is disposable. And it's shallow. But it's how we want our culture to do it. But God won't do it that way. The other way our culture is loud is it comes with angry communication to you. And it comes with edgy communication to you that is harsh, that is judgmental, that slices clear black and white lines with you. Because the more angry and the more combative and the more debating sometimes, the more we will listen out of fear. What do I mean by listening out of fear? Well, listen out of fear because we're afraid that they're letting us know that if we don't do this exact thing and believe exactly the way that they're describing to us, we will be cast out of the tribe that we thought that we were in. Yep. Or we will be canceled out. Yep. And there's a lot of communication. It's not bright and colorful at all. It's just very harsh. And that's the way our world comes to us. And it demands our attention. God won't do it that way. Amen. The gentle rabbi comes without a sound system. He comes to speak to you, and he's not even amplified. And that should rattle you a bit. Am I listening? He, he, he doesn't play it that way. You have to seek him. You have to stop everything. And I know this sounds like, it sounds like we're doing work, doesn't it? It sounds like we're seeking. And other times in church, it sounds like we're saying that God seeks after us. But today I'm saying you seek him. And which is it, pastor? Is it that God's seeking me or is it that I need to be seeking God? And the answer is it's both. Yes. It's always in the scripture. It's always both. And it's true. God is always seeking you. God is trying to capture you, by the way. God is organizing the events of your life, and he's bringing people toward you and bringing messages toward you to try to get your attention. Absolutely, he is the great initiator. Like we talk about the, the prodigal son story where the son is coming back and the father runs down the road in order to grab him. We celebrate the love of God that he loves you as an individual and he wants you. And he comes after you. We talk about in the book of Revelation how Jesus is standing at the door, knocking at the door of your heart. Absolutely he is. And he's seeking you. We talk about the fact that nobody can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him. Because the Father starts the miracle in your heart before you even know it's happening. But it's also essential that we seek God. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek after me with all your heart. So what's the formula for seeking God and finding him? You'll seek me and find me when you seek after me with all your heart. So which is it? Is God seeking us or are we seeking him? It's both. Just right before Easter, we were doing the paradoxes of Jesus. This is another paradox. It's not either or, it's both and. It's God is seeking you. You have to seek him back. You have to open up the door. You have to let him in. You have to chase him. So why don't we? I got four reasons why we don't listen to God. Number one is I want God to chase me. 
and just admit it to yourself. I'm a busy man, Lord. And I need the pastor to not be boring. Come on. I need him to be exciting. I need him to hook me with some emotion. Blah, 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 blah. And then I'll listen. And then maybe I'll respond. God help you. I mean, I should not be boring. I need to not be. I need to not be. But it should not matter. People of God, it should not matter. The excitement and the color and the illustrations and the multimedia presentation should not matter because he is your rabbi. He is your master and he is worthy of all of your attention regardless of what the blockhead does up here. You're not here for the blockhead. You're here for him. That wasn't in the notes. I'm not sure I feel good about that statement, but... God does not need to work harder at winning your attention, Christian. And he intentionally chooses not to. He holds the parable out, the treasure wrapped in a mystery, and says, will you listen? Next reason is I'm too busy. I've got too much going on. Don't you understand, God, that I've got a job, and I've got a spouse, and I've got kids? I've got a household. I've got all the things that I've got to do. And every single little moment where I'm not doing one of those things, I'm on my smartphone or I'm watching Netflix. So I'm sorry, but there's just no time left. Put it all down and seek the one who is worthy of your seeking. It's it's kind of on you guys. What will you do? I don't have time for the Bible. I don't have time for life group. I don't have time for prayer. I don't even have time to be in church. Come on. Are these the eternal truths of Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Is he your master? What are we doing? Is he the only one that can set us free from everything that binds us? Is he the only miracle worker? Is he the only one that can heal your marriage and heal your kids and heal you? Who has duped us in this life? That we are giving all of our time, all of our attention, all of our thought, all of our effort away to everything else that does not matter. Is Jesus Christ of Nazareth master or not? Face it. Because these parables should terrify you. He gave a farming illustration and walked away. Wait, Jesus. What if I didn't get it, Jesus? What if I've missed out, Jesus? Then come seeking. Because as soon as they start asking him questions, he gives them answers. Because he loves them. But it's a test. I'm too comfortable with my current lifestyle. I'm not number three. I'm not open to Jesus making demands on me. I'm not open to Jesus coming and changing my views on things. I've got all the cultural viewpoints on things, and I I know some of those cultural viewpoints don't match the scripture. And so I'd like a little Jesus, please, but I'm not going to be challenged on that. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to think about that. I definitely don't want to read about that. Is he master or no? Because if he's master, it shouldn't be up to some teacher to hit you upside the head with what the Bible is saying about a cultural issue. You should go to the scripture seeking. And I don't mean YouTube. God help you on YouTube. There's everything out there and most of it's wrong. You go to your Bible. God help me. Sit down with some Christians in a life group. Like, let's, let's chew through this together. Let's figure this out. The people of God that God has given to us. And then I'm too hurt. It's the fourth one why I don't listen. I've been hurt by God, hurt by the church, hurt by this life. And because I'm in pain, 
I'll listen to Jesus, but I really don't. I really don't care. Could I just, could I just challenge you on that? Especially in our culture today, us being hurt has become this absolute 100% excuse to not do anything. It's become reason and justification because I have pain, Pastor. That's keeping you stuck. I'm not saying your pain isn't real. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm not saying I don't care. I do care. But this, this worldly thing of that's my reason for not going forward because it's the healing that's down the road. God's got things for you. I'm going on a spiritual retreat starting today. Actually, starting tomorrow morning. I leave for Vail, Colorado. I talked about this a few weeks ago. I'm going there for three weeks just to listen. I'm turning all the stuff off. We do not have vacation plans. Some people after first service was like, enjoy your vacation. It's not a vacation. We're not going to see the sights. Just going to spend some time with God. I'm going to try and dial down the volume of this world and try to dial up the volume of the Holy Spirit in my life. We all need that. Would you guys stand? Five more weeks of parables. If you're just starting out with Jesus and you're not reading the Bible yet, could I just encourage you? Pull out your Bible. Start in Matthew chapter 1. Look up Matthew chapter 1. Start reading a chapter a day. Start getting some of that into your life. See what God does with you. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so thankful. Thank you, God, that you're the best teacher that ever lived and that the strategy you chose was the best strategy. Because, God, what you've wanted to do is to quiet our hearts in this overly loud world. You've decided to turn us into seekers so that we could find you, so that we could love you. Jesus, I pray for the souls in this room, the souls that are online right now. I pray you would capture us, Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would bring us to a new place of being a seeker. We love you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. amen.